Good morning. Can you hear me okay over on the side? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to worship. It's good to be together in this physical way after some months apart from each other. So thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing in caring for your neighbors through wearing masks and staying at home at times. Uh, whatever you can have been doing to be Christ's presence for our community and to get us uh, through this difficult time. Just a few notes before we start our time together. Um, we will be back online until September 13th. Uh, later this month, or with the newsletter, at the beginning of the month, you will receive the final draft of our plan, our return plan, uh, which starts at a new stage on September 13th, given if we have 14 days of uh, a declining trend. And so with every 14 days of declining trend, we will expand the bubble a little bit more to do more and more things uh, that we are used to doing together. And so if everything goes right, if you do your best in the community, and if our neighbors do the same, uh, we can be back inside October 11th at the earliest. Uh, and so that's the best case scenario, and we hope that is the case. So just some notes about this time together. We have asked that you wear your mask. It doesn't mean to wear it uh, down or below your chin or anything, over your nose and over your mouth to help protect each other and to keep your distance as well. As far as worship goes, we will not be celebrating communion together until we're back inside and there's a little less uh, chaos. We will have limited congregational song when we are together outside and then eventually inside. There are bulletins on the sides here. There you go, where Ashley is there. There's a bulletin there, there's a bulletin over here in the box. The offering plates have been set on those ends as well with some hand sanitizer uh, for your benefit. Sorry about the super small print on the bulletins. <laughs> It didn't look that way when I sent them off to be printed, so, um, yeah, I know, sorry, even Lila's young eyes are saying, oh boy, so sorry about that, we'll work on that for next time. And then also your envelopes for the next quarter are uh, over here if you haven't picked them up already, there's some on the table, some uh, below, uh, the box on the, below the box on the table as well. Let me see, what else? With an outdoor service, there can be a lot of things that go wrong, and so papers might fly all over, so we're patient with each other when that happens. One thing to remember for you all, when you're sitting in a chair out there, it's a little uneven ground. Be careful if you uh, bend over to pick something up that flies away, because then we'll be picking you up off the ground as well. Just one note um, about our communal life. Our sympathies go to Paul Lind, whose wife, Judy, uh, died this past month, and so we received news of that the other day, and so our thoughts and prayers are with Paul and uh, his family as they mourn and grieve and remember. We begin with the gathering litany. With open arms, you welcome all who call on your name, who acknowledge you as Lord and look to you in faith. No one stands outside the circle of your mercy and love. And so we come to offer you our worship, to declare that you are our God, and that we are your people, called and chosen by you from the very beginning. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see you here, open our minds to receive your truth, and our mouths to speak and sing your praise. For you alone are God, worthy of all praise and worship now and to the end of time. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call on you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to the Lord, to love the name of the Lord, and to be the Lord's servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant. These all I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. 
Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them, besides those already gathered. A reading from Romans. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected the chosen people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected the people whom ages ago God chose. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience in order to be merciful to all. The reading from Matthew. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and to throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. When you are a parent of two children, you may know them, they're over here, uh, you find yourself going to some extra lengths to make sure that each child is treated equally. Why? Because if they're not, you're going to hear about it. Annoyingly sensitive to any injustice, they'll tell you if their piece of zucchini bread was smaller than their sister's, or if you read to one of them for a longer amount of time than the other. You can imagine the struggle at birthdays when one is specifically celebrated and not the other. With sensors so fine-tuned to detect any inconsistency in treatment, Part of parenting is shaping children to recognize true injustice from perceived, but also to form them to be the kind of people who celebrate another's chosenness and specialness. This is part of Paul's task when he writes to the community of Jesus followers at Rome. Here you have a community of faith made up of Gentile and Jewish heritage followers of Jesus. And they all live, serve, share, and worship together. They need all of the coaching they can get to move past any and all rivalry and feelings of inferiority and superiority. Paul argues against traveling teachers who would threaten to undo the fragile community that is being formed by asserting that Gentiles need to, his traveling, the person he's arguing against asserts that Gentiles need to embrace a Jewish way of being faithful in order to follow Jesus. Paul also addresses another superiority complex that may have formed in the community. This whole Jesus thing, his life, death, and resurrection, and the subsequent movement that followed challenged all of the old certainties about who belongs to God's people and who doesn't. That God, through the message of Jesus, began to create a house of prayer for all peoples, brought healing to Gentile lives, 
brought into the center people who were previously not called or chosen, was being recognized by Jewish followers of Jesus as a wonderful expansion of the promises of God. But what did it mean, however, for those Jewish folks who did not recognize God at work in Jesus? This is a serious question, especially for those Jewish followers of Jesus seeking to maintain that identity as part of their faith. Some Gentile followers may have been of the opinion that, that God moved on from the Jewish people, that in not recognizing God's presence in Jesus, they had forsaken the calling of God and thus God had forsaken them. You see how this all plays into our finely tuned sense of injustice, into our mindset of rivalry and superiority, Upon the experience of being included, the Gentile followers of Jesus, well formed in the us versus them mentality ingrained in them by the Romans, are quick to jump to the conclusion that their inclusion must mean the leaving out of others, that their welcome means the kicking out of others, that their now being chosen and called means that those once called and chosen no longer are. God, however, does not play these kinds of games. God means to form us into people who can celebrate the expansion of God's promise, who can celebrate the good another has without thinking that because they have good, it takes away from the good I have. God means to shape us into people who challenge real injustice, we see that if another does not have the good I have, something ought to be done about that. So Paul writes, by no means has God rejected God's people. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God does not break promises. God does not move on from people once chosen. When God's calling and gifts and promises expand to include more and more people, the whole circle doesn't move elsewhere. Its center remains, while the circumference widens to embrace even those who, as Paul puts it, were once disobedient. In this way, God's mercy is for those who were once left out but now brought near, and it is even for those who are in need of learning to rejoice in the belovedness of others those who are still learning to come to terms with the idea that with God, welcome for others, salvation for others, freedom for others, does not make me less welcome, saved, or free. This is the kind of community we are called to be a part of, the kind of creation God is remaking in Jesus Christ. God's promise of life and care is growing to include everyone who has ever been cast aside or left out because of political or racial or economic or religious boundaries of superiority. Empires have shaped us so well in their forge of divisive flames meant to make us fear and hate others, meant to make us think that we are important only if we have something another does not have. In God's kingdom, however, there is healing for these ones who have been marginalized, those who we label as dogs, or damned. There's widening of blessing that grows beyond every boundary that we would put up. There's mercy for those on board with this expansion and for those who struggle with it. God's gifts are irrevocable. God's callings are unretractable. God's justice is so strange and wonderful and startling God's mercy for all moves us beyond resentment to rejoicing with the good others have and to work for real justice for those who do not have what they should. God's unwavering faithfulness is great, bringing new mercies morning by morning until the world becomes a promised place of community and justice it is promised to be. Thanks be to God. Great is thy
Confident of your care and upheld by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Responding with the Canaanite woman to each petition, help us, O Lord. We pray for the Christian church around the world, for humility where the church is dominant, for courage where it is oppressed and for faithfulness when it cannot assemble for worship. Bless your church, faithful God. Help us, O Lord. We pray for your bountiful earth, for cleaner air, for the fields on which our food grows, for the renewal of lands and waters that have suffered from disregard. Protect your earth, faithful God. Help us, O Lord. We pray for the nations of the earth, for the peaceful resolution of disputes around the world, for just policies that care for the poor, and for the upcoming political conventions in our land. Save humankind, faithful God. Help us, O Lord. We pray for all those in need of healing, for the residents of Beirut and other distressed cities, for those suffering from hurricane and storm damage, for those sick and dying of COVID-19, for the unemployed, for people without medical care, for medical workers and researchers, for the outcasts of our society, and for those we name before you now, Matt, John, Anya, Carrie, Jamie, Ann, Clyde, Sue, Joanne, Patty, Roger, Bev, Helene, Sean, Philip, Sonny. Heal the sick, faithful God. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray for schools around the globe for educators who must plan for the fall, and for children without the resources to access remote learning. Guide us, faithful God. Help us, O oh Lord. 
we mourn the deaths of those we love. And we praise you for the lives of all your faithful people, especially Allie Larson and Judy Lind. At the end, gather us all into the joy of your presence. Grant us salvation, faithful God. Help us, O Lord. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we praise Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Yeah. Thanks be to God. Amen.